My name is Kyle. I'm with Intelligentsia Coffee. I uh, do espresso blending and coffee purchasing there. Um, and uh, the man who's going to be doing the bulk of the sharing today is this gentleman right here, uh, Jeff Watts. He's the vice president of Green Coffee, a uh, pioneer and trailblazer in the industry, uh, most notably in creating the direct trade criteria, which defines so much of the coffee buying uh, that happens in the world today. And uh, yeah, Jeff's going to talk to us about coffee, intelligentsia, what makes coffee great, stuff like that. So uh, without further ado, here he is. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. So um, I'm going to tell you first just a little bit, uh, an introduction about our company, why we're here, how we got to be doing what we're doing. Uh, we're called Intelligentsia. Started in Chicago in 1995 at a time when uh, coffee as we know it, um, specialty coffee as we know it, was still really in a very embryonic infant stage. Um, it's come a long way in 15 years, and, and we're very proud to have been a, a big part of helping it get to where it is. Uh, there's still a long ways to go before coffee reaches its, reaches its true place among uh, the great culinary products in the world, like wines and cheeses. Uh, coffee is, is every bit as complex and nuanced as, as any of the best wines in the world, but it still has a long way to go until the, the public or the mainstream recognizes it as a beverage um, that is worthy of their, their dollars, their time, their, their pondering, their contemplation. Um, it's still a, a beverage that's consumed as much for the caffeine in many cases as for the taste. And it's our goal to try to change all that and restore coffee to its rightful place. Uh, once upon a time, it was considered the beverage of kings and, and princes. In the Arab world, it was, um, it was regarded like gold. It was a real treasure. And in fact, um, there's been people who have fought over, over control of coffee and, and access to it because it's, it was considered such a, um, such a gift to mankind. And there's a great book, if you ever want to read it, called The Devil's Cup, which actually um, talks about coffee's history. I'm not going to get into it today because we've got other stuff to talk about, but it's got a fascinating history. And, uh, and oddly enough, it was, it was born in the Great Rift Valley um, in southern Ethiopia, and in the same place that, that uh, many believe humans were born. So it, it's um, and, and relatively recently compared to other, uh, other forms of life. So it's something that maybe was, was meant to be with us. Anyway, um, Intelligentsia now is, is in LA. And some of you drink it. Some of you were drinking it this morning. Hope you're digging it. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, why it tastes the way it does and, and talk a little bit about its impact in the global economy. First of all, what, when we talk about quality in coffee, what are we talking about? We're talking about the sensory pleasure that it delivers. We're talking about the aromas, the flavors, the acids in the coffee that, that are carriers for so many different uh, complex flavor nuances. Uh, acidity in coffee is not to be confused with pH is in the sense of a, an orange or whatever. Coffee's actually got a relatively low pH compared to, to other um, or low acid level compared to other beverages and fruit juices. The acids in the coffee are some of the same acids that you find in fruits, like malic acid that you find in apples, or citric acid that you find in citrus fruits, or tartaric acid that you find in grapes. Uh, those are the same, same compounds that are in coffee, these uh, organic acids that contribute to the vibrancy and the, and the tremendous nuance that you can find in a great coffee. In fact, there are uh, believed to be over 800 individual compounds that contribute to aroma and flavor in coffee, as compared to maybe um, 200 in wine. So it's, you could say it's, it's uh, perhaps four times as complex as wine, in a sense. Uh, how do we measure quality? Well, we measure it first and foremost with our tongues, our palates, and our, uh, and our olfactory glands. Coffee is something that is it's among the most aromatic beverages on the planet. And what's very unfortunate is historically, most consumers have not had access to truly 
extraordinary coffee. What they drink has been um, commodity coffee, which is not not uh, produced to be great. It's produced to be cheap. Uh, and that, that explains about 99% of the world's coffee production. It's, uh, it's treated as a commodity like rice or like wheat or corn. It's grown to be, um, to be cheap. And that doesn't serve anybody. It doesn't serve consumers who deserve uh, and, and should crave uh, pleasure when they drink coffee, not just caffeine. And it certainly doesn't serve producers who historically have not uh, made much money in coffee, at least not in the last few decades, uh, as a result of worldwide demand and the, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and the global thirst for cheap coffee. Uh, that's got to change because you know, it's, it's not sustainable the way that coffee had, has been produced in the past. And unless we're able to change that, uh, the world is, is in for worse and worse and worse coffee and the millions and millions of producers who depend on coffee for their livelihoods uh, have very little hope. So anyway, I'm, I'm here to tell you that uh, good things are on the way. Coffee world is changing extremely fast. Um, you know, it's, it's not quite on the level of um, the changes that Google's bringing about. Uh, you know, coffee takes years to change, uh, whereas things you guys are doing often takes uh, days or weeks. Why does it matter? Yes, um, you know, in, a, in an economic sense, coffee is one of the most important products in the world. Uh, the number of people and economies who depend on coffee for their, their cash income is, is enormous. Um, there are over 70 countries in the world that produce coffee. Many of them uh, count on coffee as one of the largest contributors to their GDP. And many, many millions of families worldwide are are growing coffee as their sole source of cash income. So it, it matters a lot how we grow it and how we consume it. I'm going to take you first through a few, um, a little introduction. I'll try to be fast. I didn't start my timer. Uh, here we go. <laughs> I got a free 15 minutes. You know. See how I did that? Um, there's, there's many things that affect coffee quality. It's, it's actually very hard to produce high quality. Uh, which, aside from some of the economic considerations, is another reason why most of the coffee that you typically find in the world is, is terrible tasting. Uh, it's bitter, sour, uh, just not something nice. It's, there's a reason why most people put a lot of sugar and cream in their coffee. It's because what they're being served is, is uh, it's gross. The quality of the tree. Let's start with this. Coffee itself is uh, it's the seed of a fruit grows on a tree, and there are many, many different botanic varieties of coffee, just like you have wine grapes, uh, you've got Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc and Merlot. Uh, there's, there's hundreds of different coffee varieties, although only a couple dozen are in active commercial cultivation. Uh, the environment, the microclimate where the coffee's growing has a huge effect, the same way it does in wine. There's certain appellations in coffee uh, and areas that have exactly the right climate conditions to produce high quality. Uh, the, the way the farmer takes care of the coffee, uh, the, the way they provide nutrients to it, the way they manage the shading and, and the pruning of the trees, all of this has an impact. Uh, the way it's harvested is huge. The way it's processed, and we'll get into what processing means in, in a little bit. Uh, the way the logistics involved with the import, export, and movement of coffee are huge. We were just talking about that earlier. Uh, coffee is typically shipped around the world on boats, and it has to spend time in places like Mombasa or Dar es Salaam uh, that are very, very hot and humid, and it's not the right place, not a great place for coffee to be. It, it doesn't like to be exposed to heat and humidity. Uh, so there's things that we have to do to protect it on its journey. Roasting is an incredibly complex chemical process uh, I'll get into a little bit of that later, uh, but you can really, you can very easily ruin a coffee if you don't roast it right. It's not, it's not possible to take a low quality green coffee and turn it into a beautiful, delicious coffee through some special magical roasting technique, uh, but it is very easy to take a great coffee and completely ruin it. And then lastly, the way it's prepared, 
you guys are going to have a chance to learn from some of our, our uh, baristas later about extraction and why extraction, grind size, water temperature, contact time, dwell time, um, flow rate, all these things have a big impact on what sort of compounds and solubles you're removing from the coffee grounds and that end up in your drink. And you want to apply skill and, and craftsmanship to bring the right compounds, the delicious ones, out of the coffee and leave some of the, the solubles that are, are not as good in the grounds. And there's quite a bit of technique involved with that. Um, what's interesting here, these first three that we're talking about, the way uh, the genetics of the tree and the environments, uh, quality can get better based on those, those factors. And the last, uh, the last three, it's really our job as roasters and as baristas to preserve what's, what's intrinsic to the coffee. We're not necessarily adding uh, quality, we're just making sure that it's delivered all the way to your mouth. Um, these things take, these first steps, I mean, they, we're talking about centuries and centuries of evolution uh, that affects the coffee tree. Uh, we're talking about years when we're, when we're talking about cultivating coffee. From the moment that you plant a coffee seed, it's about four years until it starts to bear fruit. Uh, so it's quite a long process. Uh, harvesting happens over, over periods of weeks or months. Uh, processing in days. Roasting in minutes. It takes about uh, 11 to, to 14 minutes to roast a coffee. Uh, and the extraction happens in a matter of seconds. Uh, and so, you know, when you look at this, you understand that all of this, all of these things have happened to make coffee great. And at the last moment, you know, the person who has it in their hands and is brewing it um, can ruin it, can ruin uh, years and years and years of development in, in seconds. That's why it's important to, to learn barista skills. Um, I won't dwell on this. This is a, a little chart. I encourage you, if you're interested, to look up history of coffee. It's, um, as I said, it was born in, in Ethiopia. That area is where coffee, the only place in the world where this particular Arabica species is native. Uh, everywhere it's grown today, it's been brought there. Um, and it was brought originally to the Arab world, and then Dutch traders brought it to uh, Indonesia, and it was uh, cultivated there. And then eventually it made its way to the Americas and now most of the coffee in the world is produced in the Americas, but um, it was not native there. This is a chart that shows its, its uh, lineage and how it got to where it is. Uh, coffee traditionally grows well under shade. It likes shaded environments. It likes biodiverse environments. It's another reason why um, encouraging great high quality coffee production is important because it acts as a buffer to deforestation and development, um, city development, and, and, and shopping complexes and whatnot. Um, coffee, great coffee really needs this kind of environment to thrive. And for that reason, uh, you know, the more we drink and, and pay for great coffee, the more we're contributing to uh, this kind of sustainable farming where you've got habitats that are extremely biodiverse and um, provide a ton of habitat for migratory birds and, and all kinds of other wildlife. Uh, this is an example of a managed shade farm in Nicaragua. Uh, this is an example of an environmental disaster. Uh, this is a farm in Colombia. Uh, when I talk about terrible coffees, uh, I'm typically talking about stuff like this, which is grown on almost uh, on an industrial scale. Uh, you can see they've cleared every last bit of forest there. Uh, you can stand on the top of this hill and look around you 360 degrees and all you see is coffee. Um, that is not sustainable. They need to put a ton of uh, synthetic fertilizer and, and pesticide in this to, to allow it to grow like this. The, the uh, planting density is so intense that it, uh, you know, it's really robbing the soil of its life. And this is not the kind of coffee that we want to encourage this, however, is. Um, this here is my friend Raul from Guatemala. Uh, some of you will probably, in, in another two months, drink a coffee called La Soledad from Guatemala, from Acatenango. 
Uh, that's his coffee. That's the La Soledad Farm. It's, um, it's very well shaded. There's good uh, space between the trees. There's uh, natural forest throughout the farm. It's a beautiful place. Variety. So when we talk about, uh, about botanics, genetics, we're talking about the type of coffee tree. And as I said, it's just like wine grapes. You've got different types. Katwai is one. Um, here you see a couple others, Katura, Geisha. Um, you can see this one has purple leaves. It's called purpurescence. Uh, that's one of the first things that helps define what a coffee's potential is and what its character is going to be like. Here you see just a list. Uh, these are just kind of a few of the coffee varieties that are in active uh, widespread commercial cultivation. Uh, but there are probably thousands of native varieties that are not still unexplored that are in the wild forests in western Ethiopia. What's, your favorite one? What's my favorite one? Uh, well, geisha is an incredible, it's actually an Ethiopian transplant that uh, you know, just started really being cultivated in, in the Americas in, in a recent decade. And it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's so floral. It's like jasmine and, and coffee blossom and lime blossom and, and mandarin and, and uh, lemongrass all rolled into one. It's just an amazing, amazing coffee. Uh, but Tipica and Bourbon are, are considered heirloom varieties. They're, um, they're not hybrids. A lot of what's being grown today is hybrid coffee that's been uh, essentially bred in a laboratory and bred to be resistant to different plagues, uh, to be sun tolerant. So there are, there are varieties being grown that are, were, were specifically crafted to be able to withstand full sun, um, which is like what you saw in that, that picture before. That's called uh, Barriderat Colombia, and it's not very good. It was bred to be strong, resistant, highly productive, sun tolerant, drought resistant, but it was not bred to be great tasting. Um, SL28 is another great one. That's a uh, Kenyan a variety that's grown in Kenya. This is a, a coffee tree in full bloom. Uh, coffee, the seed, once, it, uh, once the fruit begins to set, takes about nine months, um, same as a human pregnancy cycle, uh, to mature and become a ripe cherry. But the first step of that is this flowering that happens after the first rains of the year arrive. And it's, uh, you wouldn't believe, if you ever have a chance to be in a coffee field when it's in full bloom, uh, the whole area smells like sweet jasmine and honeysuckle. It's uh, incredible, incredible stuff. Maybe you guys uh, can find a way to, to bottle it someday for us so we can, we can carry it around with us. Uh, these are the flowers, wonderful stuff. Uh, this is, uh, these brown things are, were the white flowers. They only last a couple days. They fall off, and every node where there was a flower will become a fruit. Uh, here's a little quick demonstration. Uh, how do I make that go? So it goes from a um, little pinhead. It begins to expand. Uh, those things growing in the middle there are the seeds. So the seeds are forming. Uh, eventually, and this is all happening again over about nine months, eventually they, they harden. Uh, and they become more dense. The endosperm grows inside. Look at that. Amazing. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I don't know how to speed that up. But, uh, <laughs> um, and then, what, then you have to wait for the coffee to ripen. If you pick it while it's still green, it's like eating a banana that's, that's green. Uh, it's, it's dry, astringent, doesn't have much sweetness, doesn't have much character. Um, it's extremely important to allow coffee to fully mature and ripen. Otherwise, uh, you know, you lose a ton of quality. So let's move on. There's a picture of some beautiful red cherries. You can also see a few green ones in that picture. Um, that's why harvesting takes up to three months, is they have to return to the field over and over and over again because the cherries don't always ripen at the same rate on the branch. So you have to just go out, pick only the ripe cherries, leave the ones that are underripe or semi-ripe on the tree for another few weeks or months before they're ready. Uh, that step 
of course, introduces quite a bit of added cost in the in the production of these coffees because labor is, is typically one of the largest costs in coffee. It grows in these forests, in mountainous areas, in the tropics, and you can't, uh, outside of a few places in the world where it grows on, on flatter plateaus, you really can't harvest it mechanically. And especially if you want to get perfect ripeness, it has to be selectively picked, uh, which means it's a lot of people spending a lot of time picking cherries uh, over a period of three months. And if you want to, that's usually the farmer's biggest choice, is should the farmer, does the farmer pay more people to be out in the field more time uh, picking less cherry, less volume per day? And that's sort of the, the economic, the balance where they have to find. Uh, it's one of the reasons we pay more for our coffees because we want to give producers uh, the resources and the motivation to selectively pick. Wow, well, you know, a, a whole tree, a whole tree of these cherries will only produce about a kilo of coffee. So, you know, you're drinking multiple trees. Then you can eliminate 20% because not all coffee is, is great, even from the same tree in the same branch. Um, it's amazing. I calculated once I drink uh, somewhere between 30 and 40 trees worth of coffee per year. Uh, this is another variety. This is a yellow, uh, yellow bourbon, it's called. Uh, here you can see it's a great example. Um, a lot of what is practiced in in farm on farms is called strip picking, where they just basically go in and <laughs> take everything off the branch because it's cheap, it's easy, it's quick. Uh, but that results in a huge, huge quality loss. Uh, they they do some separation, but a lot of times it just gets mixed all together and sold as one thing. What their goal is too. Uh, in Brazil, for instance, Brazil is not a super high quality producer, generally speaking. Uh, but labor is a very high quality producer. Oh, sorry. But la la labor is very high compared to uh, other producing countries. So they strip pick, but then they kind of have this backside intensive mechanized way of separating underripes and ripes, if that's what they want to do. A lot of them will just strip pick and then they really don't care. They don't need to sort it. It's going to be sold on the open market or for internal consumption at a decent price anyway. So, Okay, so that, what you're looking there where he's pointing, that's what you want. Uh, you want actually those three, three or four there on the, on the right side. Those other ones are called pintones in Spanish. Uh, they're semi-ripe. They'll introduce astringency, sourness, dryness, thinness of body in the cup there. You don't want those in your coffee, but most of the coffee you drink is full of them. Um, this is a very common, this is actually well above average uh, in terms of uh, quality picking, but uh, you know far below what we require for our coffees. But in terms of world standards, this is <laughs> this would be considered way above average. Uh, this is a great picture because you can see here very clearly uh, that coffee on the right would be uh, typical sort of commercial level picking. And the one on the left is from a farm called Malacara uh, in, in El Salvador that we work with. Um, the difference is pretty profound and pretty clear. And it, it shows up very expressively in the cup. Um, I could drink a cup of coffee and tell you how well it was picked uh, just based on how it tastes. Uh, this is the target, is what we're after. Um, but as I mentioned, to get this requires a lot more labor and a lot more cost for the farmer. So to produce a better coffee means spending more uh, on its production costs. Uh, this is a farm in El Salvador, it's doing a very good job. Uh, these are the, this is the Canales family in Nicaragua. There's another coffee that you'll, you'll have a chance to, to drink in, a, in about three months, two to three months. It's called Los Delirios. Uh, amazing farm in Segovia in western Nicaragua. And you can see here, you know, these guys are doing a tremendous job. Uh, one thing, as you were mentioning, there is sometimes a, a step in between picking and fermentation where they'll sit down and sort manually the coffees and pull out the greens or the overripes. Um, you can see that picture there. That's in Colombia. This is in Rwanda. Um, 
And that, of course, also adds further cost because you're paying people to, to sit and hand pick the coffee. Uh, so here we go. We've already told you this. You don't need to hear it again. Move along, buddy. Okay, so as I mentioned, you know, a coffee is the seed of the, co um, of the fruit. So you see there a cherry that's been split open. Each one has two seeds. That's typically accomplished um, with a manual depulper or with a mechanical depulper. Uh, there are other ways to process coffee. There's actually three ways that are prevalent. Um, one is called unwashed, which happens a lot in Yemen, in uh, Western Ethiopia, in, uh, in parts of Brazil, most of Brazil, uh, in Uganda, and in many other countries, especially where water resources are scarce. The coffee cherry is picked, and it's essentially just dried. Picked, put on the patio, and dried, and it shrivels up into a little pod. That, that tends to emphasize um, sweetness and body in the coffee, but it's also a highly volatile process. It tends to yield some unpleasant flavors alongside with the good ones uh, because there's internal fermentation happening in that, in that cherry pod, and it's very hard to get a uniform result, and it, you need really specific weather conditions to, to do it right. Um, it's not one of my preferred methods, uh, but it can be, it can yield great coffees. Uh, it's just very difficult and risky for farmers. Uh, there's something in between washed and unwashed called honey or pulp natural. This is where that coffee's pulped, uh, so that seeds are removed from the, the cherry skin, and then it's dried like that. So it's dried with, with mucilage, honey surrounding it, but it's, it doesn't have its skin. And that's a little bit more easy to control than the fully unwashed process, um, and it, it can yield really nice coffees, especially um, for espresso. A lot of people use them, including ourselves, for espresso. And then there's washed, fully washed, where the coffee is depulped, and then it's uh, fermented, and I'll, I'll show you some pictures of that in a second, and then it's washed again with clean water, and uh, the result is a very clean coffee. This process tends to really highlight the delicate qualities and tastes in the coffee. It tends to emphasize acidity and brightness and uh, sweetness as well. It's, it's really uh, it's my preferred way to do things. Most of the coffee we buy is fully washed. All right, don't need to dwell on that. Uh, this, I just threw this in there because it's a cool picture. Um, this is Yemen, and you can see people drying coffee up on, up on their rooftops. Uh, it's a very traditional way to do things. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, we have that info um, on our. We have it on our labels. We have it on our websites. We have it on the info sheets that you can find that accompany each coffee. But yeah, we we um, we talk about when we're selling a coffee. We talk about its altitude, where it was grown. We talk about the variety, the botanic variety of the coffee. And we talk about the way it was processed, and also the um, the dates when it was picked, and as you'll see in a minute, that does have an impact. Uh, that is something important. Uh, here's Brazil. It's a very large operation. Some coffee drying on the patio. Uh, here's a picture of honey coffee. You can see there's a sticky mucilage on the outside of the the parchment. Um, let's see here. There's a good picture of it. This is slimy mucilage. It's actually really, really sweet. So. Pretty tasty. And it dries <laughs> um, so here's the wash process. You can, there's a lot of ways to remove the skin. Usually it's done with a, a machine or a, a depulper that squeezes the seeds out. It's important to do it just right and have it, the, ca the machine calibrated right because otherwise it, if it pushes too much, it can scrape the, the seed inside and expose it to bacteria, which can cause uh, off flavors or taints down the road. Here's a uh, very common, just simple hand hand crank depulper. This is this is what's used most often in small scale uh, production, small farmer, small holder production. Uh, here's a disc pulper in Burundi. Uh, another one. 
This is a uh, this is a traditional pulper. It's the kind they use mostly in Latin America. Uh, you can see what's coming out are the are the seeds. Those cherries you see are are not full cherries. They're just skins, and there's holes on this thing that'll allow the the seed to fall through, but the skins to go elsewhere. Uh, skins are often used then for compost uh, to create fertilizer that'll go back into the farm. Uh, it really depends on their size. You know, really small scale farmers like in Ethiopia typically don't have um, pulpers. They'll bring their cherry to a central facility to get pulped. But uh, most producers in Latin America have some have their own pulpers, and any large size farm will have their own pulpers. Okay, we got this. There you go, another picture of that. Uh, fermentation is a very critical step in the process. Um, after depulping, coffee is put into a tank and it's allowed to ferment for anywhere from 12 to, to 70 hours in some cases, depending on the climate and the intended result. Um, what happens in that fermentation tank is that there's enzymes that are, are uh, breaking down the mucilage and, and basically cleaning off the coffee. Uh, that process is critical because if it's not done well enough, you'll have remaining mucilage that can then be food for bacteria later on when the coffee is drying. And if you do it too much, you begin to create alcohol, um, create ethanol, same, same thing that happens when you're making wine, and that can get really disgusting. Um, here's some coffee sitting in. You can ferment coffee underwater, you can ferment it with no water. Or uh, you can use a hybrid of the two. Mm. All right, let's move along. Here's a, a tank. This is a very, very typical scene. Uh, you see all this coffee sitting there fermenting in the tank, and it'll be stirred, should be stirred while it's fermenting. Otherwise, you get uneven, non uniform fermentation, which again is another labor cost. Uh, here's some guys having fun in the fermentation tank. Uh, <laughs> there's a, you know, most, most tanks around the world are, are cement, sometimes wood, uh, sometimes plastic bags or buckets. Um, more and more people are moving, producers that are interested in quality are moving towards ceramic tile um, inside the tanks, which makes them easier to clean. Uh, we, most of the farms we work with are now We've gotten them to convert to this sort of a system. Um, there's also a machine called a demucilager, which is uh, a way it sort of scrubs the coffee. It's a way to reduce the time needed for the fermentation process. And it's, um, it's actually very important technology because it's helping to reduce the need for water. And in some areas, uh, most areas these days, water is, is a very precious and de diminishing resource, and so anything that can reduce the amount of water needed is, uh, is a benefit. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we participate heavily in, in working with the farmers to introduce better practices, um, and we've, we've invested a lot of money over the years in that sort of training, in some cases, Refinancing. In some cases, we've actually donated uh, some equipment. Ah, uh, let's see. How am I doing on time here? Twenty-six. That's with my fifteen free minutes that I stole. Yeah. All right. Um, let me speed up here. I want to leave some time for questions and and some time for Kyle to talk to you about espresso. Uh, so here's some nice pictures. These are different washing scenarios. Um, all right, I'm gonna just skip through some stuff here. Uh, we'll have time at lunch too, and doing question and answers if you wanna, if you wanna talk more about some of this stuff. Uh, here's some coffee drying. Drying is very important. How you dry it, length of time that you dry it has an impact on the coffee flavor, um, coffee taste, preservation of acidity, all these things. Uh, these are raised beds. This is a very traditional African way of drying, and it's actually, in my opinion, the best way because it allows air to come 
up from underneath the, these screens and you actually get a, a more uniform uh, drying, slower drying too. And often you see these shade nets over the coffee. They're intentionally slowing down the, the rate of drying in order to, to get a, a, a more vibrant, more lively cup and to protect the coffee from overheating. Um, it's another cost, you know, every time you try to extend the length of time it takes to do something, it's another cost. These are some pyramids. It's a drying technique that's being experimented with. Uh, let's move along. <laughs> uh, okay. Most coffee is in the U.S. that you drink is washed, uh, but not if you're buying really low-grade stuff, which I hope you're not. Um, here's, a, here's a very typical scene in Sumatra. Uh, you can see this coffee is really getting uh, exposed to a lot of stuff. Car exhaust, uh, open sewers, kids running around on it, um, chickens, dogs, and cats sleeping on it. And uh, that, that kind of stuff shows up in the cup. You don't want that. Uh, this is coffee getting ruined because it's being overexposed to heat. Um, there's some clean parchment. Here you see, this is an example of a good drying technique. You know, we built, we did a project in Nicaragua to provide a group of a cooperative of small producers with these, with all the materials they needed to build these things. They help uh, protect the coffee from getting wet while it's drying, and they encourage a, uh, a uniform slow drying by also protect, filtering the sun a little bit. Uh, more pictures of that. This is a floating technique. Put the uh, cherries in a tank before you depulp them, and the ones that are are very light or don't have a lot of density will float, and you can take them out. That's one step to help uh, improve the quality, but again, now you've just lost volume. So the more you try to improve the quality, the more you're taking stuff out. Uh, so you're losing volume as a producer. That's another cost. Uh, Rwanda. This is a picture of Rwanda. Well, let me talk to you about that in just a sec. Let me bust through all this stuff here. Sorry that we don't have more time. I'd love to. What? 15 more minutes? All right. The, is that including him? Because he needs to talk, too. Oh, we can go over by 15 minutes. Sweet. Uh, as long as you guys are having fun. You're not getting bored, are you? OK. That's good. Uh, this We do a lot of, we're active in the scientific community, too, research community. We, we cooperate a lot with, with agronomists and with uh, academics that are studying the impacts of different fermentation methods, drying methods, and whatnot. This was a study that we funded um, in Rwanda to improve the cup quality, see what the effects of different fermentation styles would have on cup quality. Da, 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 da. So here's an example. Um, you see this pile of coffee. That's all the clean stuff that's been pulled out. Then all those little piles are different defects that have been taken out, broken or chipped beans that were, got cracked during the, the milling, the dry milling, or beans, sour beans, or, um, or beans that have, have burn, have uh, sunburn on them. All kinds of different defects are pulled out. And again, that's, that's losing volume. So it's, you know, if you want a farmer to take all that stuff out, you've got to pay him to do it. Um, these are some women in Rwanda hand sorting coffee. So can you imagine, you know, the best coffees in the world, they're sorted literally bean by bean. Uh, it takes a woman uh, or a man about one full day to sort through like 60, 70 kilos of coffee. Uh, so it's an extremely labor intensive process. There's 80 beans in an ounce and a 12 ounce 80 beans in a 12 ounce cup of coffee. Um, one of the, the important principles in our, our, our approach to buying coffee, which we refer to as direct trade, is that we engage very closely with everybody involved in the production of the coffee, from the, the workers on the farm, farmers themselves, workers in the mills. And we, um, we, we spend a lot of time training and teaching people about ways that they can improve their coffee and thus improve its, uh, its quality and by doing so, improve its value so they can get more money for their coffees. Uh, this is an electronic sorting machine. It's like a little laser beam. Uh, reads the 
color of the coffee and it's set for certain parameters. So if it has a slightly different color, it gets ejected from the stream. Uh, there's a close-up picture of that. That little blurry line is actually coffee beans traveling at high velocity uh, through, the, through the scanner. Um, this is an example of a cupping. Cupping is the, the protocol that we use in the industry to evaluate coffee quality. Uh, we cup sometimes as many as, as 80 coffees in a day. Uh, we cup thousands of coffees in a year. And that's, um, that's one of the principles that we apply to, to our, our buying practices. You know, most coffee is sold sort of as a unit, a bulk unit. So if you typically buy a coffee, you get a sample and it represents, you know, 250 bags worth or 40,000 pounds of coffee. Uh, we, instead of accepting that, we break it down into individual lots or batches, meaning that the coffee, we cup units as small as um, sometimes 50 pounds at a time um, in order to put together a 40,000 pound container worth of coffee. So it's a very intensive process on our end of going through with a fine tooth comb all of the coffee samples from a particular harvest day by day by day by day and only pulling out the very best ones uh, to bring to the US. Um, good enough. This is a roasting machine, uh, it's very typical. Roasting machine, typically it's, um, this is what's called a drum roaster. There's a big drum inside there that's revolving and you're roasting the coffee at temperatures of up to about 430 degrees and then you're cooling them off in this tray. Uh, a lot of chemistry involved with coffee but I'm not going to get into it. Um, but one thing that is this first line here, sucrose, you all know what sucrose is. Um, responsible for sweetness in coffee, among other things. And when you roast coffee very light, you still preserve some of the sucrose. When you roast it really dark, you destroy it. That's the reason why, one of the reasons uh, why dark cof darkly roasted coffees are, are not as sweet as lighter roasted coffees. And sweetness is a critical, critical, critical uh, part of quality. It's like imagine if you have a, a lemon, you know, you just take a bite out of it, it's not always that pleasant but you sweeten it a little bit to balance the, the acids and it's beautiful. Um, a really well grown, well picked, well processed coffee has a lot of natural sweetness so you don't need to put sugar in it to make it sweet. It's already sweet by itself. So I always recommend if you try a coffee, before you do anything to it, first taste it and see if it's sweet. Because if it's sweet, you, you probably don't want to put extra sugar in it. Um, a lot of people do it out of habit, just throw stuff in there. But, you know, fine coffee's like a fine single malt scotch or something. Can you imagine ordering a beautiful scotch and then throwing some milk and sugar in it? You wouldn't want to do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, these are some things that happen with roasting. I'm running out of time, so I won't stick on them. Uh, a few things I want to make clear, some terms that you might hear in the coffee world while you're surfing the net. Uh, direct trade. It's a term that we introduced about, uh, I think, maybe 2003. And it was simply, at the time, it was a set of principles that described the way, the approach we took to buying um, and roasting and selling coffee. And it specifically referred to the fact that we, we don't use all these intermediaries um, with our coffee. We go straight, we travel. I travel about uh, eight months of the year to go spend time on the farms, work directly with the farmers, um, negotiate directly with the farmers. One of the problems historically in the industry is a lack of transparency. There often are, the coffee can often change hands many, many, many times before it actually gets to a roaster. And every time, you know, somebody's taken a little bit out. And what happens in those cases is the, the farmer's usually the one left with the shortest stick. Um, and that's not a recipe for sustainability. It's not a recipe for quality, because if the farmer's not making enough money to invest their own resources in making the coffee better, you know, you, you end up with, uh, with crappy coffee. Micro lot, uh, we use that to refer to a single batch of coffee that was pr picked, uh, harvested, fermented, uh, depulped and fermented on the same day. 
So as I said, you know, a coffee harvest might last for three months. So over those three months, you'll have 90 individual micro lots, and we'll cup each one separately, rate them, evaluate their individual qualities. Even from the same farm, same trees, same climate, you'll get a range of quality because of the, the different environmental conditions, climate conditions during the specific day or week that it was picked and processed, um, the specific altitude on the farm, and the length of time it spends on the branch. Typically, the, the coffees picked in the very beginning of the harvest don't have as much quality as the ones picked at the peak because they've, they've been on the branch for less time, had less time to develop and mature. In season, uh, this is important thing. Coffee is not like Cheerios uh, or Twinkies. It's not something that you can, you can just sit on a shelf for, for a year and expect to taste the same as it did when you first put it there. Uh, coffee is very perishable. It's a fruit. Uh, it's the seed of a fruit. It's an organic product. It, it, uh, it degrades over time. And there's a reason why we, we talk a lot about in season. We want to encourage people to pay attention to when the coffee is harvested. That's why we put it on our bags so they can know how fresh the coffee is. Uh, generally, we say you should always cons try to consume a coffee within a green coffee. Um, not, we're not talking about roasted coffees. We're talking about the, the raw green coffee. It has about a nine-month lifespan before it really falls off the cliff. And ideally, you're drinking it within a few months of harvest. Um, so you don't want to drink a Costa Rican coffee in January, for example, because it was harvested. If you're drinking it in January, it probably means it was harvested a full year ago. And it's already lost a lot of quality. Uh, sustain. Go ahead. Post roast uh, it becomes even more perishable. Then yeah, we you know about seven days after the roast date is when you can first start to detect signs of diminished quality. Uh, the things the first thing to go is aroma, and the second thing to go tends to be the uh, the acidity. So you know uh, most coffees if they're stored well you can you know you can still drink them and and get. 99% of what you should be getting uh, for, for up to two weeks. But uh, ideally, we recommend, you know, buy as much as you need for a week, and, and that's it, and then go get some freshly roasted stuff. Post-grinding, Post ooh, you know, that now you're talking about minutes, literally. If you grind it, um, you're exposing it, a lot of surface area, to, to oxygen, and the oxi oxygenation process goes fast. Um, you could grind the coffee and, I mean, you can try this at home. Grind it, smell it, wait uh, five minutes, smell it again, wait ten minutes and smell it again. You'll see it, um, a, lot of, a lot of the aromas go away very quickly. So buying pre-ground coffee is a horrible, horrible idea uh, because you've already lost about half of, <laughs> of the quality just because it's, it's been pre-ground. Um, let's move on. Just a couple things. Some of the goals of direct trade, as we as as we conceive it, are to engage with producers, to um, actually participate in process control and, and introducing better technique and, and a methodology at farms, um, and transparency and traceability. It's critical, critical, critical. Uh, if a farmer is not, you know, we we look at farmers as our our partners in coffee, um, not as vendors. Our suppliers and, and we need them to do great work in order for us to have great coffees to sell and they need us to be out here educating consumers and, and advancing the value of coffee the perceived value of coffee getting people to understand what it's really worth so that they can in turn get paid what they should be getting paid um, we use we're also very much interested in looking at how the systems working on a farm one of the biggest sources of, of pollution in, in coffee farming is wastewater, uh, which is oftentimes just dumped into river systems, dumped into soils. Uh, so the farms we work with, we make sure that they're um, segregating the water after the fermentation and that they're treating it with lime and putting it in sedimentation tanks uh, and, and filtering it so that what they're releasing back into the environment is clean. And actually then they can take the other stuff they pulled out and put it into their compost and reuse it as fertilizer. Um, and of course, the, the, one of the, the main and primary goals of direct trade 
is to get better coffee. And that's what got us started in this in the first place. When we, when we began in 1995, we were buying coffee the same way everybody else does. We call up the importer. Uh, there's, there's dozens of importers or traders. Some are multinational, some are more local. But they buy and sell coffee, buy it from exporters, sell it to roasters. And we'd call them up and say, hey, man, what kind of Guatemalas you got this week? Say, oh, I've got these three Guatemalas. I'll say, OK, I'll take that one. And uh, you know, it's very limiting. You say your choices are limited to whatever somebody else happen to buy and then is selling, offering to you, um, you don't have any, effect, any ability to affect the way it was produced. So we got very frustrated with that. That's what drove us to go to Origin and start working with farmers is to actually play an active role in making quality better. Um, some components, tiered pricing systems that, that really um, are specifically tied to the quality. So as the quality gets better, the price can rise in sync with that. Uh, use of transparency contracts where the farmer gets to see exactly what everybody else is making. They get to see what the exporter's making, what the miller's making, uh, and they can see that they're getting the lion's share of the coffee. We trace our coffee all the way to the farm gate, whereas most coffee is not, not traceable like that. You know, Most coffee you'd buy off the shelf, you have no idea what the producer made, and the roaster who sold it to you has no idea what the, the, the farmer actually made. Uh, we do. Other stuff. Let's go. I'm, uh, I don't want to steal Kyle's time. I think I already have a little bit. Um, it is expensive to do direct trade. I mean, we have a whole staff of people just involved with quality control. We have a, a big staff of very well-trained roasters. Um, and then we have our buying team, which includes uh, Kyle and myself and, and two others, who spend, uh, at, you know, most of us spend at least a third of our year traveling around visiting all these farms and, uh, and working with the farmers. I do a lot of education. Uh, Rwanda is just, this is one of the last things I'll leave you with, the, the profound effect that introducing coffee quality can have on, on a large number of people. Rwanda before 2001 was not producing a single bean of specialty grade coffee. They were, they were producing coffee but it was, uh, it was terrible quality. It was being sold as, as like blender coffee at an extremely low price, below the, the actual cost of production, and being mixed into blends by you know, your favorite um, multinational roasters. And you know, nobody was benefiting from coffee at the time. But there was a big uh, project funded by USAID, um, the Borlaug Institute, Texas A&M, um, and we, were, we participated a lot in this over a period of five years uh, to go into Rwanda, teach farmers how to wash their coffees, introduce um, modern technique, um, quality-based quality technique and methodologies, uh, give producers the infrastructure, we built all these washing stations in Rwanda, um, organi help organize farmers into cooperative groups, and put in place all the systems needed to produce a great coffee. Um, today, Rwandan coffee is, is a hot, uh, hot coffee in the world of specialty. In just a few, you know, the space of, of maybe five or six years, it went from being um, junk with no value to being a, a highly coveted uh, specialty coffee, meaning that the, the price the producers were getting per pound uh, effectively more than quintupled uh, just because of this work. And the GDP of Rwanda as a nation it has grown, um, like I think, more than uh, more than 20 percent in the last in the last decade, and a large chunk of their income is coffee related. So I mean, you can see that 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 um, devoting time and making commitments to quality and coffee, not it doesn't just get us as consumers a better tasting drink. It actually provides um, a meaningful livelihood to to huge numbers of people across the world. Uh, here's an example of a transparency contract. I won't spend a lot of time because we're out of time. Uh, this is an example of how we break coffees down into qualities. Normally all these coffees here, all these different producers, all their coffee would just be mixed and sold as one thing. We break it down farmer by farmer, and then by each farmer we break apart all their individual lots. It means a lot of cupping, a lot of tasting, a lot of sorting, 
but the result is a, an incredibly tasty coffee. Uh, there's some farmers in Papua New Guinea. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this is something that when we talk about seasonality, um, you can kind of look at where a coffee producing country is located relative to the, to the equator and get an idea of when their harvest season is. The, the places um, down here tend to harvest like in May, June, July. And the places up here tend to harvest more in um, November, December, January. Uh, so generally, northern hemisphere coffees, you want to drink them in the spring and summer and fall. Southern hemisphere coffees in the winter and the early spring. Um, and I think that's just about it. Uh, relationships, important. Uh, cleaning your water, it's important. Uh, making sure farmers get paid right, it's very important. Uh, coffee is really, as I said, it's one of the most complex beverages known to man. Um, producing coffee is a great coffee, truly great coffee is very, very hard to do. There's so many things that can go wrong and usually do. Um, but still people are reluctant to pay for coffee. Uh, they, we have a consuming culture that is, has been weaned on diner, you know, 50 cent bottomless refill diner coffee. They don't know that coffee can be a culinary delight. They don't know anything about how it was produced. And they don't know that, you know, by drinking that kind of coffee, you're supporting a very unsustainable method of, of coffee production. And people will often go into the 7-Eleven and buy a Red Bull or a, um, or a can of Coke and pay $2 or $3 and not blink. But you ask them to pay $3 for a cup of coffee and they look at you like you're crazy. And, uh, you know, despite, as you've seen, all the work that has to go into the coffee, uh, coffee is also an incredibly healthful drink. Uh, more and more now, if you start to Google uh, coffee and health, you'll start to find studies that are demonstrating coffee is powerful antioxidants, more antioxidants than tea. Uh, it's got polyphenols that are anti-cancer, um, have anti-cancer uh, um, characteristics. They, there's a, some recent studies that show coffee is probably the most effective known preventative for Alzheimer's disease, uh, for Parkinson's disease. Uh, men who drink at least four cups of coffee a day have a 30% lower chance of getting prostate cancer. Uh, you know, coffee is actually a, a it's kind of a miracle um, uh, health drink. And I was just at an ASIC uh, scientific conference in Indonesia last year where they spent a whole um, day talking about coffee and health, presenting the latest research. And the, the closing statement by, by the, um, the, the doctor who was presenting was that coffee, within the next decade, will come to know coffee not just as a health drink, but probably the health drink. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. uh, hi, everybody. I'm Kyle. Um, my talk is going to be far less in depth than Jeff's because actually uh, the, the major principles of what I'm going to talk about are going to continue with some hands-on training after lunch. You guys are going to get your paws on those delicious new GS3s that you have, which is as good as any machine sitting on any Intelligentsia bar. You're incredibly lucky to have that. Um, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about espresso and sort of how Intelligentsia fits into the context of uh, espresso, how we approach it, what we think is important, uh, and all of that. Um, and I think it's important to know that uh, espresso coffee, in some form that we understand it today, uh, has existed for about 110 years. Um, it really, in 1901 is when uh, mechanized espresso machines were born. Um, and for all of the 100 years that followed, uh, basically the approach to espresso has stayed largely the same, which is to create something that always tastes the same, that always tastes like chocolate, pretty much, or sort of heavy, dark, intense, punch in the mouth kind of experience. And this is understandable because espresso coffee for much of the, yeah.
Yeah. What's the difference between espresso and regular coffee? What makes espresso espresso and regular? Yeah. Regular? So espresso uh, is is two things. Espresso is a process for uh, brewing coffee, and it's also a beverage. Uh, so uh, and and a liquid espresso is usually defined as around an ounce uh, per single shot, uh, concentrated. But you want to know about espresso blends. No. Or want to know about the beans. What makes a bean an espresso bean? Uh, it's coffee. Is it different from regular bean? No. OK. So I can use like Intelligentsia regular drip coffee for espresso? Yeah, but so <laughs> uh, this will be good for the Q&A, I think. Uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, uh, we blend espresso to a certain profile. So we use coffees like for the Black Hat Classic, which I think is a coffee that you guys are going to use a lot around here. Um, for that, we blend to sort of low acidity. And it's a combination of the coffees that we buy and how we profile the roast. So we buy coffees. The, the Black Hat, the majority of it is, uh, is uh, coffees from Brazil. And uh, Brazil, Brazilian coffees are typically processed uh, either in the natural way or the unwashed way that Jeff talked about, or the uh, pulped natural or honey process uh, that Jeff talked about. Um, and what this yields is an extremely sort of low acidity, high sweetness, heavy body, which is very suitable for what people expect from an espresso. So Black Hat is, is pretty much always 80% coffees like that from Brazil, and 20% something washed, something a little bit more acidic to bring some, you know, balance and, and, you know, interesting complexity into the mix. But uh, like a chocolate covered espresso bean uh, is a probably a dark roasted coffee bean covered with this, with chocolate. Espresso beans are that's just that's uh, something that somebody made up sometime. Um, but uh, there's it's not like a, a different kind of plant or something like that. Um, uh, yeah, good question. Very good question. Um, but in the in the last ten years, and coinciding with the sort of uh, prominence of of direct trade, uh, really espresso and 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 I'm I'm going to make a bold statement. Uh, and I'm sorry if there's people watching in other countries. I'm going to say that this has been led in the U.S. Uh, largely, but uh, approaching espresso not just as this sort of condensed. Uh, liqueur that is always supposed to taste the same, but actually as a sort of way of brewing any coffee uh, that you want to brew um, that reveals sort of different sides of it. Um, and, you know, it was that premise that espresso is, is flexible and interesting and dynamic that led Intelligentsia to uh, sort of give birth to this project called the Black Cat Project. And the Black Cat Project essentially applies uh, a lot of the direct trade uh, purchasing criteria, principles of collaboration, uh, things like that, to to espresso, which uh, had never really been done before, still is not really widely practiced. So uh, we have, uh, at any given time in our lineup, between three and six uh, different espressos uh, with various single origins. Uh, so, you know, you can have a, a Kenya that is specifically sort of roasted for an espresso um, or a seasonal blend that uh, uses in-season coffees that are sort of directly traded uh, for, for espresso. Um, and, yeah, I'm already out of time. <laughs> uh, no, I can keep going? Okay. Um, Cool. Well, I kind of came around to my conclusion. Um, but uh, uh, I, I guess, do you guys have any questions about uh, espresso or about Black Cat or anything like that? Yes. Sorry. When you're putting together blends, other than sort of the, the body, the, the sort of typical Brazilian thing, right. what, what, what do you guys look for and how strange have you gotten with that? Well, you know, if we're putting together sort of a, a, an outlier blend, uh, one that we have right now is called the Honey Badger. And the Honey Badger was constructed because we had this really exciting Kenya. 
and I really liked it as espresso. Um, but I recognized fully that the Kenya on its own was not balanced, that it needed something else. Um, so, you know, much like a sort of, uh, you know, wines from certain appellations that carry certain designations, there's an expectation that, you know, one primary varietal be blended with a little bit of something, something else to give it some balance. So this Kenya, which is from the Kangocho uh, factory uh, washing station, it, it was searingly bright on its own, like tooth enamel removing brightness. And so uh, that wasn't appealing, but what sort of, you know, some of the interesting acidity was. So we brought in some more sort of base heavy chocolatey coffees to complement it and just, just, you know, bring it back from searingly bright into the realm of, you know, very, very interesting, but also very intense. So, and then we named it after a, a really mean animal because it's intense. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Good. Right here. What's your process for uh, decaffeinated coffee, and does it lose a lot of the flavor in what do you guys do, or no? Uh, decaffeinating coffee loses, uh, yeah, it, you lose a lot um, in that process. And I've actually never seen it with my own eyes, but we typically use the water process, and Jeff can probably okay, get yeah, a, I can a lot more detail it quickly, to it. Quickly, um, the most traditional and the most common pro process used for decaffeination uses a, it's called a solvent-based. Uh, they use uh, chemical solutions of things uh, with, with nasty sounding names like methylene chloride, uh, uh, which bond with the caffeine. They take the coffee beans, they steam them to open them up. They throw them into a solution uh, of methylene chloride, which bonds with the caffeine molecules. And then they, they rinse it out many times, flush it out, and then redry the coffee. And it's... Uh, and it's, the caffeine's removed. But that leaves a, um, a uh, it alters the chemistry of the coffee a little bit, and there's a certain taste associated with that. Another one is uh, sometimes called the natural process. It's also a solvent called ethyl acetate, uh, which is something you find in bananas. It's a naturally occurring uh, compound, which is why they call it the natural process. Uh, but it also does give you some uh, sort of additional taste. And then there's the water process. Uh, which is increasingly becoming more, more common. Uh, that's what we usually use. And in that process, there's, uh, it's basically osmosis. The, they take a, a, a pool of water, they, they soak some coffee beans in there, and just naturally over time, uh, molecules and compounds migrate out of the coffee and into the water, uh, flavor compounds and caffeine. Uh, they repeat the process. Um, several times, and then they filter that solution through uh, carbon filters that are cut to be the same shape and size of the caffeine molecules. So when they go through there, the carbon filters capture the caffeine. Uh, and then they, they run that solution through those filters enough times to where they, the solution then at the end has no caffeine, but it's saturated with these flavor compounds. So then they'll take, they'll throw away the coffee they use in that batch um, of flavor charged solution is what they use to decaffeinate the next batch of coffee. They'll throw it in there. Caffeine migrates out, but the, uh, the flavor compounds can't migrate out because it's already, the water is already saturated with them. Um, and then they'll redry the coffee and they can use, they recapture that caffeine and sell it to, um, so to soft drink companies and whatnot. But, uh, you know, you can use, you can get really nice tasting decafs. The problem, the reason that there's so many bad ones is usually people use the leftover coffees, like the lower grades that didn't have a lot of export value. Those are what get sent to Germany and decaffeinated. And so usually you're not used, most companies aren't using their best coffees for decaf. Uh, but we take the same coffees that we buy for a regular, we'll, we'll take them, send them to be decaffeinated. And, um, you can get a great tasting decaf, but it will be a little bit less intense than the, the caffeinated version. Uh, are there other, any general coffee questions or questions about anything I talked about? Alyssa. Yes, Alyssa. Where do we send them to be decaffeinated was the question. To Mexico. Mexico. Um, 
There's a couple plants that uh, there's a place in uh, in Veracruz, Mexico, that we use to do most of our decaffeination. Uh, we've also done it in Vancouver. There's a company up there called Swiss Water that has a decaffeination plant. Uh, there's one in, in um, Quebec called Kisek. Um, uh, there's now one in Texas, actually, but typically we, we do it in Mexico. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. But you also mentioned the single origin, which made it, would make a terrible espresso on its own. Right. Um, how, how do you... Uh, he can, uh, I'll repeat the questions yeah. if you want. Yeah. Uh, Uh, how do you know which uh, single origin coffees to try uh, for as espresso? Well, uh, I think it's it's sort of trial and error to begin with. Uh, a lot of people sort of develop their own uh, preferences. There are lots of baristas, just like you know, in beer, you know, there's there's like these people who are just incredibly into hops, and like no amount of hops could be too much hops for these people. Um, and, and there certainly are plenty of baristas at home or, or in, in the profession that, you know, love acidity. Like, there could not be too much acidity. So a high-grown, high-acidity, uh, you know, single-origin washed coffee that's lightly roasted from, like, Kenya or Yerga Chefe, uh, which is Ethiopia, or something like that, might be exactly what the doctor ordered uh, for this type of person. Uh, whereas for the home user or for somebody who's just doesn't prefer that, you know, they might prefer like generally like if, if you get a like, clean Brazil, that's going to be an extremely balanced sort of low acidity profile. Um, Nicaragua's, uh, Bolivia's, Rwanda's, I think all make wonderful espressos and a lot of roasters now and increasingly so they're actually identifying coffees specifically as a single origin espresso and labeling it as such and, and roasting it to sort of enhance that. And we do, we do that as it comes along, uh, as we find those coffees that we feel need a little bit of encouragement in the roaster to, to you know, potentially be a great single origin espresso. But for you at home, it's kind of like experiment and decide what you like, I guess. Or here, I guess, yeah. So I was watching a couple of the bursts outside, and there was a guy basically um, measuring the grounds to the very gram and measuring the, the amount of the length of the bloom time to the very second. How much time do you have, or how much flexibility do you have for innovation and experimentation? And does that only come in the, early on in the development of the, the growing process? Uh, in a, are you talking about? You're talking about in the brewing or just overall in the whole thing? Just overall, with that amount of quality control, it seems like everything is very strictly, um, I guess, regulated or, or done. Well, it is, you know, so in, in that case, like when you're actually brewing coffee, you know, it's like uh, if you land on something that you like, because we, we don't get to QC every cup before we hand it out to a customer. So we implement like some kind of metric so that we can continue to repeat, you know, the thing that we like. But as far as like in the entire seed to cup chain of coffee, it's so expansive. We are essentially, and I think Jeff would agree with me, we are in diapers. Like we don't even know uh, what the potential is. And and something else that's, that's pretty amazing is uh, a couple of years ago, we started to host this event called the Extraordinary Coffee Workshop. And uh, at first we hosted it in Colombia, and last year we hosted it in El Salvador. And we brought together direct trade partner farmers uh, from all over the world, Kenya, uh, uh, you know, El Salvador, Brazil, Bolivia, all over the world into one place to talk about what they do. And you know, all of them at some point had a moment where they were looking at somebody else and saying, you really honestly do that? They, whatever it was, because there's colloquial sort of uh, ways to produce coffee, and they haven't made it outside of these little tiny towns. I mean, when Jeff described the wash process and pulp natural and natural, that was like, you know, very, very general. But 
everywhere you go, you encounter in like very different methods, and there's always something sort of new or interesting happening in producing and coffee brewing. I mean, even sort of the wide adoption of those uh, Japanese uh, ceramic cones that we were using out there is that's an incredibly recent phenomenon, and uh, machines are changing all the time, and baristas are talking online all the time. Uh, and and it's actually kind of like breakneck speed uh, how quick things are changing. So or at least that's the way it feels being in the industry because we have to keep redesigning our coffee bars every six months. Yeah, uh, there's, I mean, the, <laughs> so the short answer is that yeah, there's a tremendous amount of room for for innovation still. I mean, we're still a long way to go to get all this figured out. Um, the thing about coffee, which is kind of sad, despite being such an important global. Um, commodity, and despite being such a, an amazingly complex beverage, the amount of uh, research that's been put into coffee is, is tiny compared to like corn or something. And part of that is because coffee is not grown in, in developed countries, typically. You know, so US research dollars or European research dollars aren't really going into coffee, they're going into soybeans and corn and wheat and whatever. Uh, there's a, a big need for more research in coffee, and there's so many variables I mean, so many little tiny variables, including like what kind of uh, microorganisms and bacteria are in the air in the place where the coffee is being fermented, that get into the water and affect the affect the fermentation process. You know, there's something, a lot of things you can control, and then a lot of things that you can't. You know, like the weather, you can't control that really. So, or at least not yet. Maybe Google will figure that one out. Um, but there's, yeah, there's there's a lot of work to be done. Definitely. I have a question about acidity. Uh, you talked about sweetness, but I have a preference for highly acidic coffees, both espresso and drip. I was wondering if you can talk. Maybe, like, how do you get the, or does that come with the bean? Is that, does that get lost in the roasting process? What countries acidity comes from? Yeah, what definitely. Um, acidity is something that's present in the green coffee. Um, and there are, there are dozens of, of acids that contribute to the overall profile. Um, the most dominant tend to be, there's one called chlorogenic acid, um, which actually, this explains why if you take a cup of coffee or a pot of coffee and you leave, leave it sitting for like 20 minutes, it gets more sour. Uh, that's because the, the chlorogenic acid breaks down at room temperature and turns into quinic acid which is a sour, it's what you find in tonic water, it's a sour acid. Uh, so you, that's one of the reasons why you never want to leave your coffee sitting on heat, because that accelerates that process, and after five minutes you'll degrade the chlorogenic acid and turn it into sour quinic acid. Um, but citric acid is one of the most important, um, and as I mentioned before, malic acid, acetic acid, tartaric acid, um, lactic acid, all of these contribute to coffee. and the. The amount, the quantity of acid that's in the coffee depends on a lot of things. It depends on the, the botanic variety of the coffee, or the genetics of the coffee tree. Some varieties um, produce more acidic seeds. Um, other varieties do not. The other thing that uh, affects that is the climate. So generally, um, when you have climates or growing conditions where there's a big range of temperatures between the nighttime and daytime temperatures when you have warm days and very cool nights. Uh, that's the perfect environment to develop more acids because it affects the metabolism of the, of the tree. Um, and it also means that the cherries take longer to mature, so they spend more time connected to the tree and they're developing more organic acids that whole time that they're on that tree. Uh, so generally speaking, coffees grown at higher altitudes, where it's cooler at night, will have a longer maturation cycle, and they'll have more acids than a coffee that's grown at a, uh, a low elevation. The other piece is processing. Um, there's certain the washed process tends to uh, really, really emphasize the acidity and really bring it out, preserve it, whereas the natural process, where the coffee is dried inside the seed, tends to diminish the, the acids um, that are present in the raw green coffee bean. Um, and then roasting, you can destroy a lot of acids. Um, if you roast extremely dark, you, you um, degrade the acids too. 
Um, and then also with brewing, if you brew with water that's too cold, you won't extract enough of the acid. So you need to have the water at the right temperature. So basically the answer is uh, all of those things contribute. The, the, the genetics of the tree, the climate in which it's grown, the way in which it's processed, the way in which it's roasted, and the way in which it's brewed all have an impact on, on determining, determining how much acidity will be left in your cup. And um, you know, if you, you're an acidity lover, uh, which I am too, um, Kenyan coffees are typically some of the brightest out there. Um, really high grown Central American coffees tend to have a lot of acidity. Um, Indonesian coffees tend to have less acidity because of the way they're processed more than anything. Uh, Brazilian coffees tend to have less acidity. Um, so yeah. Yes, sir. On, on that note, on that note, what do you? Uh, what's your opinion of cold brewing? Because you've said that you know, oh, the after you grind, you know, mm -hmm. all the outgassing and everything will take place in a matter of seconds, even. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you leave that brewing for twelve hours at a time, uh, what's your opinion of? Uh, I'm not personally. Oh, the question was. Oh, you got it because you had the mic, right? You got yeah. the question. Um, Personally, I'm not a fan of cold brewing for those reasons because... Uh, we disagree. But he likes it. Uh, many people like it. Some don't. You know, it's one of the things that's great about coffee is there's not, you know, there's, there's room for personal preference and personal tastes. Um, you know, some people love acidic coffees. Some people love um, softer, milder coffees. Um, but yeah, I mean, personally, I'm not a fan of cold brewed coffee. Um, and my friend here, Kyle, likes it a lot. I think that cold brew coffee emphasizes sweetness and acidity pretty effectively, actually. And, it's a different uh, kind of acidity, though. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, <We're> gonna... <laughs> wow. He said, he said. Yeah. Uh, we were going to do a column where, because Jeff doesn't like espresso either, so if that gives you some context. Um, <laughs> uh uh, no, I actually love cold brew, and you know I think that the the cold and long extraction is kind of interesting. I I don't think that you lose anything necessarily uh, because it's suspended in water, and there's not like you're not getting like this uh, any sort of abnormal amount of of you know gases sort of driving out that would normally give you aroma or something. So it's 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 good. It's I mean it's actually actively extracting the whole time, just very slowly, as opposed to just ground coffee that's sitting there losing all of its aroma. Uh, a friend of mine sort of, you know, gave me a really good way to communicate that. He's like, you know when you first grind coffee and it smells so awesome and you're just like, oh, it smells so good. Well, that's like actually the aromatics just fleeing, uh, you know, at breakneck pace, like, gr like brew now. Uh, so, yeah, anyways. So you talked before about Rwanda or I guess in general these these processes are very difficult. Um, it requires a lot more attention, and so it's a lot more difficult to, I guess, for you guys to scale. So I'm wondering from, but you also said that Rwanda had increased their GDP based on a lot of these changes. So I'm wondering from your end, are, can you guys scale this? And also from the farmer's end, are there other companies like Intelligentsia that are stepping in and are saying, hey, we want more coffee, we'll pay you more money, um, and, you know, pushing farmers to actually start caring about these things? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a quiet revolution happening right now in the world of coffee, um, and, and it's happening fast. I mean, 10 years ago, there were not many companies at all uh, doing what we're doing. In fact, I would, I would venture to say zero. that there were zero. Um, today, there, there are quite a few more, and a lot that are just starting. Um, and, and the new generation of coffee companies have... have um, been introduced to coffee in the last 10 years, and, and they've learned you know, from, from some of the companies like ourselves that are, have, been, have been at this for a long time. And so the new generation of coffee roasters are, are coming up in this new environment where they do care about uh, the conditions on the farms, and they do understand that quality is, uh, is the target, that it, that's the thing that can differentiate coffees and make them uh, more valuable. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 definitely catching on, um, but there's still a long way to go. I mean, it's still a, a a niche at this moment. You know, there's there's a handful of companies worldwide that are extremely active, 
um, but but it's still a, a small minority right now. I think in in another ten years, um, it'll it'll be even more a larger percentage. In terms of scaling, um, I would say there is a limit. I mean, we couldn't scale infinitely. I think you reach the size of a company like Starbucks or something, the volume that you're doing it's so large that you know, you lose a little bit of control, you just by necessity, because the, the volume you have to go through is so vast that you, you know, it's harder to pay attention to the smallest details and the nuance, because you're, you're cupping a coffee to select it, you know, and, and that coffee is, is, you know, a whole container, 40,000 40, pounds of coffee might be consumed in a single day or in a matter of hours in the, within a, uh, a company that size. So it's very hard to pay attention to those details. Uh, for us, you know, I feel like we could easily be about five times our size um, and still without losing a thing. Uh, but it means continuing to invest in more infrastructure. For farmers, um, you know, they can continue to scale, but it's a slow process. They can't do it overnight. And there's a limited amount of, um, of land area that's that's optimal for high quality coffee, and it's actually shrinking. You know that land area is shrinking due to climate change or due to to uh, higher average temperatures in some of these growing areas. Uh, it's also shrinking due to commercial development, like places like Costa Rica, which used to grow a lot of coffee. You know their production is is decreasing every year because the land that was being used for coffee growth is now being converted into real estate development and 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 uh, commercial, other commercial uses. So, yeah, I mean, there's a limit. It's not infinite. But there are, I mean, there's countries like Peru that still have a huge amount of perfect growing conditions to uh, where coffee can be planted in the future. So my question, uh, so where you're, when you're on the road and you can't make your own cup of coffee and you feel like having a coffee, where do you go? <laughs> no, you can always make your own cup of coffee. You take it with okay. you, man. That's yeah, you bring answer. you bring the kit. You bring uh, your little kit with you, and you make hand it. Hand grinder, uh, Hario V60 cone, uh, you know, a little carafe, um, and you know, if you could fit it like a, a kettle, uh, like a pouring kettle. You, yeah, you and and if I'm somewhere where I just you. can't access clean water, or I can't access any um, any electricity to heat anything. I'll sometimes just bring a little bag of beans and just eat them like uh, like granola or something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and and another really important thing. I mean, generally the consuming habits in producing countries is really really uh, not so great, like in terms of the quality that is considered acceptable. And uh, coffee is actually exactly the opposite from tea in that regard. Tea producing nations consume their best stuff, export their worst. Coffee-producing nations export their best stuff and consume their worst. Internal consumption is actually like something like if 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 Jeff is you know cupping coffees with a few producers and you know talking about it, you know you might point to a coffee and say like you know internal internal consumption, and you know that would be something that was just abysmally bad. Um, so unfortunately, that's. Uh, and and but uh, in Brazil, actually, I think, and and probably a few other countries, there's a big push to to make uh, you know what's available inside the country uh, great, so that people get excited about it and want to produce more great coffees. I think so. Yeah, actually, the the, the barista competitions that are taking place now uh, every year, more countries start participating. You could you could Google uh, WBC World Barista Championship and, and learn a lot about it. That's actually become a huge vehicle um, for promoting understanding about uh, better consuming habits and and what better coffee, what quality means in coffee in countries that are producing it. Um, we actually have back there, Mr. Mike Phillips. He's the current reigning World Barista Champion. Uh, he well, won he won in London. Last and year. and Percy who and Percy was a finalist in the Guatemalan in the Guatemalan championship and Kyle who won the U.S. national championship a couple of years ago, um, but yeah it's it's one of the and Nick uh, it, it is one of the saddest saddest uh, Nick has really nice hair saddest things that you'll see is you know you go to a place like like Guatemala or Colombia and you know you're sitting there in this pristine area beautiful natural forests and you've got 
some of the most incredible coffees in the world growing around you. And you, and then what people are drinking that are living right there, they're drinking packets of soluble uh, Nescafe. It's, uh, and you scratch your head and say, man, you know, you're surrounded by some of the, the most astonishing coffees in the world, and you're drinking, like, the, the worst that you can get your hands on. Yeah, and the vast majority of producers have never tasted their own coffee. The vast majority. Well, that means we'll we'll have to pay more for it. <laughs> They'll be competing with us for it, which is already happening. If the if you um, if you look up the global coffee prices, you'll see that we just hit a, a 34 year record high, and it's part of the reason is is decreasing production. Part of the reason is is countries like Asia, uh, or or continents like Asia and countries like China, um, and India starting to consume more coffee, and places like Brazil consuming their own coffee means there's less to go around, and, uh, and coffee is now getting more and more expensive, which is another reason why it's critical that we're able to teach people you know, what the real value of coffee is, why they should be willing to pay more for it than they're used to, and, and what they're getting out of it when they, when they pay more. Um, another question? Can you, get, can you give a quick overview on what we should, what we should be doing at home to make a, a solid cup of drip coffee. I mean, I know this this V60 thing. I mean, is there just a quick... Yes. I know the process is probably very complex, but uh, sort first, of at, at a high level. Uh, I don't know how you guys feel about uh, iPhones, because I know you have your own thing, um, but uh, we have an iPhone application that uh, hopefully will launch on Android pretty soon that uh, de breaks down step-by-step step, like a number of different brewing processes. Um, I think, you know, a couple of keys are to pay close attention to the uh, ratio of water and coffee. Uh, make sure you have a burr grinder. Make sure that is, like, that is the essential piece of coffee equipment componentry. Um, don't go for the DeLonghi $30 burr grinder. Go for the Capresso $100 burr grinder. Don't go for the $300 ele electric drip brewer that says good morning uh, and tells you what the weather is and makes, reminds you to, to get to your flight. You know, use the little ceramic Hario cone. I think, you know, if you spend $150 on gear, you will have, like, a great setup. Um, but pay attention to coffee and water ratios Use a, a burr grinder right before you brew it. Um, and uh, fresh, clean, awesome water uh, that is not too hard. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the second time that's been asked today. Um, well, freezing coffee does slow down the sort of staling reactions that are happening. Um, you want to make sure that not only is it airtight, but that you've evacuated most of the air out of whatever the bag is that you're using. Um, and, and then, yeah, you can hold the coffee for, a, like, for longer, but it's not, gonna, it's not just going to hold. It's not actually frozen in its current state. It continues to degrade. I, I think, you know, we, we just... We don't really think of coffee that way. We think of it as being a thing that you get every week, and then you drink it like throughout the course of the week, and then you get more, and then you drink it throughout the course of the week. And you know, by and large, you know, our experiences empirically are that you know we like fresh roasted coffee, and uh, you know, straight out, straight out of the bag, fresh ground, tastes good, and it's also exciting to go from one thing to the next as, you know, lineups change. So, yeah, you can slow down the staling process by freezing coffee, but I think people forget about it. And, I mean, I was talking about, you know, every Christmas when I return home to my mother's house, I find last Christmas's, you know, gifted coffee. Uh, and that's just too long uh, <laughs> for something to be frozen, so. Yeah. Hey, last question. I think we got to wrap, right? Or we can talk over lunch. All right. Well, for the worldwide viewers of, in Google, uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for paying attention. I hope uh, I hope you you are 
ready to devote yourselves now to quality and coffee. And, uh, and I thank you very much for your MAP programs because I just moved to LA and without them, I'd be so lost. I couldn't get anywhere. <laughs>